Good morning, everybody. Uh, the numbers of uh, participants seems to have stabilized more or less, more than 180. Welcome to the second day of the EOSC symposium dedicated to the uh, COVID-19 data sharing. Uh, I'm Kostas Linos. I'll be your chair for this first session. Um, a few words of introduction from me. Uh, Back in February, end of February this year, when the um, prospective magnitude of the pandemic became clear, we uh, sat together the commission to see what could we do from the uh, research and innovation side in order to help the fight against the pandemic. So we uh, had this uh, the so-called era, European Research Area versus Corona Action Plan with a number of actions uh, that we launched together with the uh, member states. A lot of these uh, actions uh, required the cooperation of uh, other countries. And one of these actions was the establishment of the um, uh, European COVID-19 data platform. Uh, thanks to uh, the collaboration of many of our friends, partners and stakeholders, uh, many of these are today here present, uh, we were able to very, very quickly come up with uh, something operational. So with the work starting in March, on the 20th of April, we were already able to launch a first version of the uh, data platform. And today, this uh, uh, platform has already received about 3 million requests for data downloads from 92,000 different users in 170 different countries, if my uh, data is right, which is pretty impressive. It's very impressive. Uh, the countries is the, is, is the big majority of the recognized the territories. Uh, so we will have uh, actually a platform that's used not only in Europe, but uh, everywhere, uh, pretty much everywhere around the world. The idea was to demonstrate uh, the value of data sharing and accelerate scientific discovery and innovation for the benefit of everybody. Uh, it is the, the platform was developed as a priority pilot under the umbrella of the EOSC, of the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and uh, it is only thanks to the dedication of EMBL, EBI, to Elixir, to uh, several other uh, partners, projects, collaborators, that this came to fruition uh, so quickly. Obviously, the platform operates uh, in line with the Commission Open Science Policies, and it is true to EOSC's guiding principles, and therefore a very strong focus is placed on ensuring that the data discoverable through the platform are as fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and open uh, as possible. Uh, it is not just the partners, uh, the scientific partners and the Commission that uh, brought the platform together, but the member states and associated countries have also played a very important role by creating national coordination teams to facilitate the submission of various data types to the platform. And furthermore, many countries, um, Sweden, Slovenia, uh, Spain, Poland, uh, Netherlands, Norway come to mind, but there are others that have established, are, are in the process of establishing national COVID-19 data portals connected to the European uh, platform. Recently also we heard that the Japanese version of the portal uh, was also launched. So the platform is now in the process of tackling two very important challenges. First, the linking of viral and patient genetic data with the clinical data of the patients. It is a very difficult one. And then exploring uh, how to bring together laboratory data with data from the social science and humanities, which is another major challenge. Uh, if such challenges are overcome, we will open ways for better understanding the disease. For example, the susceptibility of the population to COVID-19 and the causes of the variations in the severity of the disease in the case of the connection with clinical data. And in the case of uh, SSH, social science and humanities data, to contribute to our understanding of socioeconomic challenges that uh, I expect to endure well beyond the current pandemic. 
so we see these efforts, uh, this uh, major effort, monumental efforts uh, undertaken by the platform as a blueprint for the integration of health data for research more broadly, paving uh, the way for the future European health data space. Uh, and by the way, here that tomorrow and the day after there is um, uh, there is a, a, another related meeting on the uh, health uh, cloud. Um, so to discuss these challenges and to discuss progress so far, we have a panel of uh, distinguished speakers, panelists, participants, uh, and I will immediately uh, give the, uh, the word to uh, Guy Cochrane, who leads the European Nucleotide Archive, a platform for the management, sharing, integration, and dissemination of sequence data. Dr. Cochrane is an authority on the large scale international sequence data sharing. Uh, for example, under the COMPARE project, Dr. Cochrane led the adaptation and extension of ENA, the European Nucleotide Archive, for the purposes of rapid global pathogen uh, data sharing and which is used as a foundation for the uh, European COVID-19 data platform. He has a background in cancer research and many years of experience in bioinformatics services and driven numerous developments within the sequencing uh, informatics uh, world. Uh, Guy, the floor is yours. Guy? Hello, okay. Do you see a full screen slide? Yes, we do. Great. Well, thanks very much, Costas, for the introduction, and thank you to EOSC for the opportunity to present the platform. And so, as we've heard, we found ourselves uh, with a responsibility at the beginning of the year uh, to contribute to the response to COVID-19 as it emerged. And that translated into a a scientific response in which we would provide uh, scientific data that could be used broadly by the research community uh, to advance our understanding of the disease and its progression. And so we were able to move very quickly. Um, we, by April, we were able to launch um, the, the European COVID-19 data platform. Uh, at the time, we had significant data connected to the system and some of the functions um, that would later emerge, uh, but it's uh, by no means the, the end product. Uh, we've seen iterative developments and there's a lot of energy around the further development of the platform uh, as we go forward. And so the premise is really that biological molecules uh, and the, bio, the biomolecular data that we can derive from those molecules are, are really critical in understanding infectious disease. Uh, so the, the, the bio, bio, biomolecular data tell us about, um, they help us identify pathogens, virus, uh, and how those viruses spread. And they tell us about the biology of the virus and of the host, the humans that respond to the virus when they're infected. And in turn, these tell us about the kind of treatments that we can use. Uh, they inform how public health makes its interventions and they guide the design of vaccines. And then in, a, in an elegance cycle, uh, these things in turn, because one uses molecular methods to assess effectiveness of, of, of many of these responses, uh, that gives us more bio biological, biological information about the molecules uh, and more biomolecular data. Uh, so it's a, a virtuous cycle. So the focus of the platform, the center point is really on those biomolecular data. So information about the virus and about the patients that are infected by the virus. But of course, the, these data only make sense when they're seen in the context of many broader things. And so we need to look to the clinical, we need to look at diagnostics, we need to look at um, how patients respond, uh, the many laboratory measures and clinical measures that one can make. Uh, we need to look at the history of therapies and other exposures. We need to look at the contacts the patients have had. And then we step out even further, we need to consider uh, population level epidemiology and the social sciences. So how do people behave? What is the use of, or how do people comply with social distancing? What is the socioeconomic status of, of, of people that, that are infected? Uh, so it centers upon biomolecular data, but very much sits these data in the context of these, these broader domains. So for that reason, the system has elements that are both centralized uh, and elements that are uh, distributed. And so on the top left here, we have uh, the centralized components. The focus here is on the biomolecular data. 
Then at the national level, we have the sensitive human, the sensitive patient data, uh, including biomolecular data, but also other health data, the clinical data and the public health data. And then at the European level, uh, we have uh, data from the, the many research infrastructures across Europe. Uh, for example, screening data, uh, clinical trials data, animal model data, biobanks, and, 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 and many more. And then all of this can connect internationally, uh, so to present the European face of um, COVID-19 research. So one reason we were able to make a, a, a rapid start was that we had some very strong foundations. And so my institution, the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute, um, has a long, decade-long, or decades-long history of, uh, of providing databases and services around biomolecular data, everything from sequences, genes, genomes, through to proteins, to structures, to uh, biochemistries and, and, and the scientific literature surrounding those. And then we have uh, Elixir, which is the coordinating the bioinformatics data coordination network for Europe, which has provided a very smooth way in which we can connect into national activities around bioinformatics. Then we have the European Open Science Cloud, which provides the link to the European infrastructures. Uh, and, and really together, it's the, uh, it's the EBI, Elixir and the European Open Science Cloud that are providing the infrastructure partnerships. So we're the infra infrastructure partners for this project. Then over the last six or so years, we've been working with academic, scientific and medical partners from different institutions to build on top of the infrastructure to build infectious disease specific uh, elements. Uh, so the COMPARE project, as an example, uh, led the way in building open data sharing systems for pathogen data. Uh, and the system that we now use very much builds on top of this. And so COMPARE was a project that was led by the Erasmus Medical Center and the Danish Technical University um, uh, so Marion was the coordinator of, of COMPARE, uh, but major contributions from many other partners, including the National Institute of Public Health, RIBM, uh, in the Netherlands, Eotwish Lorand University in Budapest, uh, and, and University Clinic in Heidelberg. Um, so we're supported, we were supported in COMPARE, and we continue to be supported uh, by the, the, the European Union under Horizon 2020. There are now five projects that are supporting the uh, the, the European COVID-19 data platform. On the infrastructure side, Elixir Converge, EOS Life and Corbell. On the research side, and you'll hear more about these two from Marion, uh, Recoded and Bio. So the platform itself makes data available, uh, scientific data available, uh, and it's across a diversity of data types. And the aim is to make these available as rapidly as possible. It's a diversity of platforms that are supported, um, and it's a, it's a diversity of scientific reasons for generating data that are supported. And we support data of different degrees of completeness. So everything from the very raw forms of data through to the processed, QC, interpretable forms of data. And the aim then is to make this available in integrated form uh, for the research community to, to, to blossom around it. There are three technical components. The SARS-CoV-2 data hubs provide for those who are sequencing uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. They provide a toolbox that allows for the uh, management of viral data, for the uh, processing and analysis and interpretation of those data, and for the connection of those data, the sharing of those data into the global, uh, the global whole, the, the complete set. The second component is the Federated European Genome Phenome Archive, and this component addresses the, the need for uh, sensitive human data to remain within the countries in which they're produced, typically sensitive human data do not travel beyond national borders. And so this is a, a single technology that, that, that is federated. So it allows na nations to set up uh, instances of a database that connect technically uh, across a federation. And one can apply the same searches and the same kind of interfaces to find data, regardless of where they are, go through the same processes for access requests, regardless of where the data are, and be routed towards those data appropriately. So a federated system to allow uh, joined up treatment of, of, of sensitive human data. And the third component on the right here is the COVID-19 data portal. And this really is the entry point for most people who are accessing the platform. It allows people to search uh, and to navigate across the different data and provides access to the tools for people to push the data into the system and access to standards and so on. Uh, so this brings together data from the hubs the uh, sensitive human data system, but also a variety of other data sources, including the um, uh, including those of the, um, of the EBI that I mentioned before. So just very briefly, the kind of data flow that supports is, well, the data are produced at the level of a patient, 
They are managed and organized at, at the national level, very typically, and they are either they either flow or they're connected to the data hubs, to the federated EGA and to other data resources. And then they're presented in an integrated fashion through the portal to the, to the scientific community. So one early priority was to make sure that biomolecular data were well connected. Uh, so we now have something like 300,000 different uh, biomolecular records that are available through the through the platform. Uh, this is across, I think, 16 different databases, focusing on sequences, expression, uh, protein structures, functions, biochemistries, compounds. So, so, so uh, databases of compounds that are active against particular targets, uh, and then the scientific literature, including preprints around all of that. And this is all um, searchable and navigable within a single system, uh, accessible and downloadable, and so on. And then for um, the contextual resources, we link out um, and we're working on, come back to this, we're working on a deeper integration of these. Uh, so there's a, a, lot, a growing number of, uh, of, of initiatives and databases that, that are connected and searchable uh, through this system as well. So one of our early priorities uh, and, and, and something we worked uh, quite significantly on in the first six months of the platform um, is the mobilization of, of, of information about genetic variation in the virus. And really to access deeply and precisely variation, one needs to have access to raw sequence data such that one can uh, process those data, handle sequencing errors consistently uh, and systematically to produce a, 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 a reliable understanding of the whole. Um, so raw sequence data were not being shared very broadly at the beginning of the, back in April, uh, but we've, uh, we've worked very substantially to try to, to, to reverse that situation. And so once one has the raw data, one can enable all sorts of analyses at, at a much greater precision than would otherwise be possible. So we mobilized significant effort to uh, work with uh, those who are producing viral sequence or those who are setting up viral sequencing. Um, and we now have approaching 100,000 different sequence libraries. So that's that the viral, that's 100,000 viral isolates that have been sequenced, which we have raw data. 38 countries, 300 institutions, and the growth has been quite significant. So we have the SARS-CoV-2 data hubs operating at national level in 16 cases. And it's important if you look at this map, you probably can't see the numbers, but, but if you look, the red, in red we have the data hubs, and in blue we have the, um, the other routes through which data come into the system. Um, and 70% uh, of the data are coming through the data hubs. And um, you do see there is a focus on Europe because we've focused our efforts so far on, on Europe. Uh, so this is a major global uh, contribution. The platform itself is really driving uh, the mobilization of these data. So we have some curation on these data to improve the quality, particularly around the library, the sequencing methods. Um, there are three computational workflows from Erasmus and RIBM uh, that are available for analysis of different types of data in this set. Um, and then we have uh, an assembly product that is currently being QC and we hope to be releasing that soon. On the right, this is just an example of the kind of quality, uh, quality metric navigation system that we will offer when that becomes available. So there are many other things going on at any one time. I can't, I can't cover them all. Um, here we have the, um, the energy that's going into building out the federated EGA. So for the sensitive human data, there's a lot of activity in many countries and building their national nodes. We're expecting to see the launch of the first national nodes uh, this year still, um, and then more added next year. First comers will probably be amongst the Nordic countries, Germany um, and, and, and Spain. Uh, but already, because we already have a NAC, we already have a central EGA system, we already have human uh, genetics data flowing into the system that, that are available through the platform. Uh, not all data types have uh, appropriate databases with the appropriate structures. And so we're working on, for example, serology data for which we need to build with the community data standards um, and perhaps a, a database that, that will be able to serve these data uh, into the system. We have um, uh, an effort into organizing data by cohort. So there are a great many uh, emerging studies uh, from in Europe and, and elsewhere um, that uh, study cohorts of patients and um, many of these connected to different data types. And so this cohort study support is a, this is a browser that you see that allows people to navigate these um, cohort data and drill down into the data. On the right, we have at any one time many developments going on around analysis tools. Here's some phylogenetics from our Danish partners, um, a dashboarding tool here. Um, we have 
uh, taken a very active role in promoting fair practice and openness and data. This is an announcement um, uh, from us a few months ago. Uh, we're working on deeper indexing. So for those, uh, those data types that are not, not directly in the middle of our point of focus, we need a deeper indexing and, and greater navigability from biomolecular data to those data types. Um, and then we're working on different elements of quality control and curation. This is a, a partnership with uh, Norwegian colleagues uh, that are uh, improving the curating sample, uh, sample data, uh, information related to viral samples. And so just to finish, um, the, the system is being used uh, very broadly. On the top left here, we have um, uh, building out the connections to clinical epidemiological data at a national level. And I will uh, leave this to, to Marion, who will cover this in, in much more detail. Down here, we have an example of drug development. And this is a, a platform called Open Targets, which has uh, used data available from the, the, the platform, uh, curated and processed those data, to produce a set of target genes um, and uh, lined up against those target genes compounds that, that have different activities against those genes and have a status in, in, in terms of uh, trials and, and clinical trials. Um, and all that information is presented. This has actually become gone full circle because we now have included that as a data source within the, the portal. Uh, so now this is included within the platform as well. Another nice thing on the top right here has been um, the national coordination that Costas mentioned. Uh, we have um, been pleased to see that different countries have uh, been quick to set up national data portals that, that align and connect to the central data portal under the platform. Uh, and actually now uh, we've launched, we, we, we make available a web toolkit of different web resources uh, graphical components, style sheets, and so on, to allow people quickly to spin these up. And the function of these really is to help the national coordination effort, where there are national activities, particularly around those, um, those, those patient data. Uh, this can be the entry point for scientists within a country to access those projects, uh, but then it connects onwards into the central portal for, uh, for the, the centralized data types, for example. And then finally, on the bottom right here, we have a, a use case from the, um, the bioinformatics developers uh, under the Galaxy system, uh, and so this is uh, this is this is a system that allows people to do different types of bioinformatics analysis on the data on the platform. So this sits on top of the platform and pulls data from it. You can run different analytical workflows, and what's shown here is the the the, the reverse component of that, the reciprocal component, that is a tool that supports people who have produced uh, sequence data. It supports them pushing those data uh, up into the port uh, from the Galaxy system. So that's where I leave it, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. That's, it's impressive always to see how much has happened in the last six or seven months. Uh, I remind everybody that you put your questions through Slido, and we'll take a few questions to the, uh, present, to the speakers at the end. Uh, I, it is now uh, the turn of the uh, next presenter who is uh, Professor Mario Kopmans. Kopmans uh, she focuses on global population level impact of uh, rapidly spreading zoonotic virus infections with special emphasis on foodborne transmission. Her research focuses on unraveling the modes of transmission of viruses among animals, uh, between animals and humans and among humans. How relevant, Marion, for the case of uh, the COVID-19 disease. Uh, she is coordinator of uh, VIO, uh, a project of uh, Horizon 2020 that aims to develop approaches for early warning of uh, risk of emerging disease emergence. And she's also PI in the PREPARE project, uh, another EU uh, project of Horizon 2020 on harmonized large scale clinical research studies on infectious diseases and in a dedicated also COVID 19 funded project linked to PREPARE. Uh, in 2018, Marion received uh, the NWO Stevin Prize, uh, which is one of the most prestigious distinctions in Dutch science. Marion, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so what I will do is um, ex explain um, what the use case is that we're trying to develop to really test uh, which are the connections that we need to establish to make the uh, uh, COVID data uh, initiative uh, really uh, 
fully explorable also for clinical research. Um, and I do this from uh, my background, uh, working both in public health and in, in the clinical environment. And these are uh, efforts that are building from the project, some of which you just mentioned. Um, there's been a, an initiative uh, for the World Health Organization uh, already in 2012, I think, to explore um, and to prepare the minds for uh, starting to work with deeper laboratory data in the whole public health uh, uh, arena. This was then uh, working with uh, viral uh, genome sequences as part of the uh, toolbox for public health. The uh, COMPARE project that uh, developed uh, uh, tools and uh, analytical approaches uh, to really uh, uh, capitalize on the fast development of next generation sequencing uh, approaches in different fields, both public health, clinical and, and, and more basic research, and PREPARE, which is a network of uh, hospitals and general practitioners across Europe that has prepared for doing uh, operational uh, research during outbreaks, including clinical trials, and now has also received additional funding to work on uh, COVID through the RECOVER project. Then uh, RECODED, which is a project uh, looking at uh, merging data from across cohorts. This was uh, uh, bringing together cohorts that, that were developed in response to the Zika virus outbreak a couple of years ago, and AVAG, which is linking uh, mostly European uh, virology laboratories around a virtual biobank of uh, strains and, uh, and, and, and tools. Um, and a common uh, series of activities in those different projects has been to uh, uh, inventory what are the current hurdles that we really need to fix. Um, and those are um, a whole range at the te technical level. Uh, if we try to start combining data generated in different uh, uh, laboratories, for instance, there's of course a variability of platforms, of, of methods, um, there is a variability in how you analyze the data, um, but also access to that. Uh, what is the uh, infrastructure needed in order to have some meaningful analysis? Uh, we see increasing challenges in terms of uh, data volumes uh, and the storage needs. And we've done substantial work around what does it require for people to really uh, be willing to share in a, in a timeful, time, a timely manner. And here's one of the uh, publications around that. To the right, you look at um, an image that we put together just to also help uh, people in the public health arena understand. So the bar here is, so this is sort of size of data when looking at uh, uh, databases that, that uh, work with um, uh, pathogen genomics. Uh, so this is the, the data that uh, is constituting the global WHO measles database. Uh, here, one of the global HIV databases and the EpiFlu, the global influenza surveillance uh, database. And uh, of course, with the entry of NGS data in the field, you get far, access, far in access um, uh, data sizes, data types, and th these existing uh, systems really cannot handle that type of data currently. And that's something that we need to work on. Now, uh, of course, uh, what is also clear is that uh, data sharing is easily said, but it also means a lot of different things. Uh, and there are highly diverse data types. Um, that today we are talking about linking uh, clinical data, genomic data, and what sample derived data with uh, complexer uh, analytics, more complex analytics, but there's also other types of data out there. And in the VIO project that, that started in January, that of course I didn't have time to work on <laughs> since January, but we are also exploring these very different data types that are out there 
and that may be interesting to mine also for infectious disease uh, questions. Now, for the work that we're trying to do uh, now specifically for the SARS-CoV data cloud, um, I think it's, it's critical to get some case studies going um, because uh, because of this this issue, uh, what do you put out there, and how is that going to help us as a sort of a community trying to learn from these uh, data sharing uh, initiatives? So it is around what exactly are the questions that we're trying to address. So for that, we are uh, developing uh, the uh, uh, some of our own experience as a case study. So this is. Uh, a data case study with, within uh, the Netherlands. So where we have um, in uh, the hospital that I'm involved in and that the, Vero, the next speaker is also involved in, we have a local patient database which collects clinical data, some background data that is a part of the uh, now standardized global ECRF developed through ICERIC. It also collects whatever diagnostic data that make it back into the patient file. Uh, and it collects uh, information on informed consent and uh, other data that uh, the next speaker will be presenting. Uh, so that data is now uh, a part of a national uh, initiative to try and aggregate and compile this type of data for the different uh, hospitals, university medical centers that, that uh, work on these for sharing into the international ISRIC platform and then also for open to requests for research uh, at the national level and presumably also at the international level. Now, what we have linked to that, uh, but not yet included uh, is uh, some deeper laboratory data. There is pathogen sequences, there's T cell data, B cell data, transcriptomes, uh, 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 serology array data, and what have you, from uh, deeper uh, study patients within this national cohort. And that data sits in local repositories, either in our laboratory or in the laboratories of our collaborators. And there's different types of routes to, to work with that data. Then we have uh, external patients that are not hospitalized, but for which we get uh, requests for testing or they are part of, of separate studies. So we generate data there as well. Um, we have uh, studies going on at the human animal interface. Uh, so for instance, uh, large scale sequencing of mink uh, uh, on mink farms, but also humans involved on mink farms and environmental samples on mink farms. Um, and we are sharing that data in many different directions. So uh, one is uh, the national public health uh, database that, that is developing that has a mandatory route of notification to the European CDC. There's data uh, shared back um, to WHO in relation to, to requests for support. There is immediate release of sequence data through the GizAid platform. Uh, we work with the data hubs uh, that Guy just explained. Um, and of course, there's all different uh, EU projects that may have may or may have not have their own data sharing initiatives. So this is just to explain the complexity of the landscape that we're looking at when we say clinical uh, and lab data around patients. Um, and the listed here in orange shows a, a map of the stakeholders that are involved. So we, of course, have clinical research. We have uh, different types of laboratory research. We have the people that send us requests for testing. Um, we have a different set of stakeholders when we look in, in uh, animal uh, 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 spread of SARS-CoV, national public health, international public health, and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, researchers that would like access to the data for deeper analysis. And 
I think it's very important to recognize that these all live in very different worlds and have their own ideas about what you can and cannot do with the data and whether or not they are willing to offer data for that initiative. That's what we've learned from the, from the different studies in the previous projects. So um, now you're looking at the same figure and uh, I have colored the arrows to, uh, to mention, I think three different types of activities that we really need to, to make this data fly. So first of all, when looking at the combination of clinical data and deeper uh, laboratory data, uh, we need to figure out ways to, to link the uh, clinically oriented national data uh, uh, collections with that, the data hubs that uh, Guy just explained. Uh, so that's the first level of uh, uh, data connections that needs to be made. Um, of course, when it then comes to the sharing to different uh, initiatives uh, um, or agreements, um, that needs to be uh, clear how that is done um, and what are the, uh, the, the cultures of sharing there. And um, in order to really also pull people in, we need to make this as user-friendly as possible, but also offer some added uh, benefits for the people that generate the data. Um, for instance, in terms of scalable compute and meaning, meaningful uh, feedback if they uh, deposit data and that feedback could go as far as uh, working on a data, data citations that, that can be used for, for CVs and for um, you know, showing impact in the, in the field. Um, and that stakeholder uh, engagement is something that we've worked on a lot with the Compare project in developing the data hub uh, model where you say, okay, so you have a data and information platform, but eventually what you really would want to know is what is actionable information that you can get out of there. So, uh, and trying to work with stakeholder communities to, to see what their questions would be and how would that work with linking all these data because that's eventually what really makes it it, it most meaningful so um just to conclude here is I, I i guess the the message is that sharing covid data is easier said than done um many different fields are involved uh, and that that are that live in 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 different uh, bubbles it's the, it's a popular word nowadays uh, when trying to contain. Um, and the willingness to share really requires uh, a building uh, trust. Um, and that trust uh, in places where fields merge really needs to develop. So part of that needs to be a very clear governance. Who can do what? Um, what is the you know, what are the safeguards with public versus private use and things like that. And um, what is in it for the people that 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 uh, generate and and release the data? How uh, so? So working on really constantly demonstrating the added, added uh, benefit for them. Um, and that's I think, yeah, that's where I would like to leave it. Thank you, Marion. Many thanks for this insightful presentation, it's the complexity is tremendous. And um, I mean, it's so difficult to, breed, to build bridges and connections between the different fields that it is, um, that shows the magnitude of the challenge. Uh, if we, um, this is for the case of uh, COVID-19 particularly, one, when one talks about the health data area overall, the magnitude of the challenge is even bigger. And then when we talk about EOS code data, in general, uh, one can imagine, but these are used as blueprints. And this is uh, what is in our mind, how it is how we see it for building the uh, health data cloud, health data space uh, progressively. And then uh, from, from that and doing the same in many other areas for building EOS cover all. And I, I say this because there's one or two questions that um, ask about the, um, how does this fit into 
the uh, EOS, the European Open Science Cloud in development. Um, before going to a, a couple of questions, uh, to other questions, uh, I would like now to pass to the third, to our third uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Vero Nissen. Uh, professor Nissen is at the um, uh, is a professor at biomedical image analysis and machine learning at Erasmus and Delft University of Technology. He's fellow and was president before of the Mikai Society. And he's also CTO of HealthRI, which aims to develop a national health data infrastructure for research and innovation. Uh, in 2015, uh, Vero received the uh, Simon Stevin Award. Uh, and in 2012, he founded Quantib, an artificial intelligence company in medical imaging, where he is now uh, the scientific lead. Vero, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I would like to compliment on the previous two talks that uh, uh, that showed the uh, enormous importance of data sharing, sharing, but also the challenges. And I would like to take the uh, perspective from trying to uh, make the uh, clinical data uh, accessible. And uh, we do that as part of uh, uh, HealthRI, which is indeed an effort to build a, a national health data infrastructure. So um, we see everywhere that because of the enormous uh, uh, increase in opportunities of data science and AI technologies, that the importance of data-driven techniques are uh, becoming increasingly important. And, and, the, and the same is, I think is uh, true in this COVID uh, crisis in which we would like to learn from data. But we see in general that in uh, the life sciences, data-driven uh, uh, research is confronted with quite some challenges. So first of all, we see an enormous fragmentation uh, uh, of data, images, and samples that are collected in different places and under different uh, uh, conditions. Uh, there's a clear lack of standardization, uh, both in the care process, in which reuse of the data is often very problematic, but also in research. And because of that reason, we see that the, the, the quality of data and the, the possibility to reuse data for research and innovation is often uh, quite uh, uh, problematic. Also, uh, sometimes there's ethical and legal constraints. Uh, uh, sometimes they are per perceived, sometimes they're real, but clearly uh, a researcher struggle with the ethical and legal framework in many aspects of, uh, of data-driven research. So that's the reason we've uh, established uh, HealthRI, and HealthRI really tries to create an ecosystem in which data-driven research can thrive. And that means that there's activities in many pillars. A lot of issues are related to ethical and legal issues. So there's, there's clearly the need to work on, on, on governance and, and uh, other parts of, of, the, of, of making sure that there is a legal basis for reusing data. So that's one part of the activities of HealthRI. The second is the actual established establishment of a health data infrastructure, which requires data to be collected in a fair way locally and being linked to each other in a, in a federated network. And then third, we need, once we have such an infrastructure, we need to provide early access. And I think uh, some of the examples given uh, today in the earlier talks saw already how uh, important it is if you uh, provide such tools and how, how well they are going to be used. But in terms of clinical data, uh, uh, reuse of clinical data, it's sometimes even more challenging. Now, because we had this uh, vision for health array and are developing it, also we became active in the field of, of COVID because clearly uh, the, 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 the way we can uh, uh, deal with the pandemic is going to uh, be improved if we can learn from today's uh, patient. But we do see the enormous uh, uh, challenge in order to find the right data, uh, to make them uh, accessible and to link them to other data. Uh, so what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic that many, many initiatives were initiated in parallel. And sometimes some of those initiatives really grow very large and have become very powerful. But also we see a, a lot of uh, uh, parallel efforts that are difficult to integrate. So one of the first things we did is ensure that we provided an overview of all initiatives 
But second, and perhaps most importantly for the long run, we started to uh, build towards building a, a national par a portal in order to support observational research in the Netherlands and beyond in collaboration with, uh, with, with others. So what are the uh, uh, things we are encountering when we try to establish a, a data portal for reuse of, of COVID data? So first of all, there is the, 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 the legal question. Is there a legal basis for reuse of the data and how we, do we ensure we have the legal basis? And there's a lot of issues uh, related to consent. Do you ask that at the beginning? Is there a, a, how do you deal with people at the intensive care units, et cetera? So these are all questions that individual researchers face and for which there is uh, not, uh, not, not clear answers. And this, be, this has been actually hampering the reuse of data in many, many efforts. Then second, uh, in order to be able to reuse data, it's very important that we adhere to uh, uh, international standards uh, linked to lab data, clinical data, image data. So it really requires that uh, both in the, uh, the, the clinical care setting and the research setting, there's good data stewardships and, and that institutes are aware of the international standards that are being, being used. Also because many of the patients do not enter uh, 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 um, clinics in which research is being performed. So there is a disconnect between uh, where, where data is being collected and where there's people that are interested in reusing the data for research and innovation. Then when you collect multiple data and want uh, to make them accessible, uh, the, the question is really uh, for what question, who can access the data? And uh, we need a clear data governance policy. And the moment that you start to collect multiple data from multiple resources, virology data, imaging data, clinical data, there's more and more stakeholders and more places and, and building an efficient data governance becomes increasingly uh, complex. And then finally, you need, once you have a data governance procedure, once you have connected the data, you need a proper portal in space to, in place to be able to search the data, to request for them, and to get them uh, delivered for your research. I would like to share with some of the issues we're dealing with and we've been encountering uh, in the process of uh, uh, building this uh, uh, um, infrastructure for COVID data. So with respect to consent, uh, this is an issue we're still uh, uh, dealing with and, and struggling with. Uh, ideally, we think now, and we're, we're, we're discussing this with the government, that uh, uh, we would like to work towards a, a national consent register in which, in principle, uh, people, uh, 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 people's data can be reused, but there's always a, a, a facility in which easily they can withdraw uh, uh, their consent. And in this way, uh, uh, we, we would have a national database in which uh, a consent is being uh, dealt with. Uh, with respect to data access, uh, we've worked uh, initially with the university medical centers. There are seven in the Netherlands, so that's uh, overseeable. And there we've started to work towards a, a governance procedure, how we will deal with requests once the, the, the data portal is actually going to give out data. And uh, I think this is an essential step uh, uh, of making such a portal useful because you're going to connect so many data from so many different disciplines and, and, and different uh, 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 places. And then a, a, a third thing we really encounter as an issue is uh, eventually how we're going to uh, uh, longitudinally keep on connecting data. So if, if you have a prospective study, it, it's easy to, 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 to link the different data that are being collected. But if you uh, uh, retrospectively start to uh, connect different data, because you also would like to uh, link the data we're collecting in our portal to data uh, prior to the people that visit the clinic, you need some way to couple the data. And uh, how to deal with that is a main issue. Uh, we, we have a, a, a one uh, citizen number in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, over the years, it's always been discussed whether we cannot have like sort, sort of a national pseudo ID to start to link these data. And because of uh, COVID, those discussions have sort of uh, 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 gained st steam again, but it's really important how to couple the data. Uh, just to uh, um, 
uh, um, tell you a little bit about the status of the different steps. With respect to the data governance, uh, this procedure has been approved. Uh, uh, how we will deal with requests once uh, researchers uh, will request data via the data portal. And uh, there will be, uh, um, at, at the moment of request, there will be both a scientific evaluation of the data request. This will be uh, uh, done by a committee with representatives of all university medical centers. And there will be, uh, uh, we will we'll make use of the local institutes to look at uh, the, the legal and ethical aspects of the data collection. So uh, I think this is quite important and this is new for us that we, because of COVID have such an overarching data governance uh, process in place, how we could uh, make data from uh, multiple Dutch hospitals available for, uh, for reuse and innovation. So this, this is a bit of a complex figure, but this shows a little bit the underlying idea of the final portal. So in the middle, you see here the data portal. It will, uh, in principle, not be a centralized uh, portal where you have the data, the image and the clinical data, but rather it will have the information which lab data, image data and clinical data are available at the centers that participate in the portal. So in the left top corner, you see an individual hospital. This hospital will be helped uh, in order to store their data uh, adhering to the international standards. So for example, in Erasmus MC, this is the study that uh, Marion Koopmans referred to, in which we are collecting all our data adhering to the international guidelines with respect to the lab data, image data, and clinical data. And the idea is that Erasmus MC will notify the national portal about the data it has available. If other research centers do this also, you can create a catalog over different centers, making the data that are available searchable. The data governance uh, process is in place and eventually this uh, will enable us to search through data of multiple institutes and request the data. Uh, towards the horizon, because eventually we would like to turn the individual hospitals into what we call so-called fair data stations, that the data are not only uh, uh, collected in a fair fashion, but they're, that are also computer approachable. Uh, uh, in the long term, you could also think of, for example, approaches to uh, support federated analysis and federated learning and applying uh, AI technologies on this, uh, on this framework. But to be honest, uh, we are really in the early steps. I mean, thinking of distributed learning and having all hospitals in the Netherlands as fair data stations is something that we want to establish in the long run. In the short run, we see how much work it is to start building this portal. And just to uh, understand the, the, the status and the phase we're in, what we've been doing, we have work, a working group with the university medical centers now in which we uh, ensure that we're now harmonizing all the ECRFs, even though most hospitals started from the ISERIC, still there's quite some heterogeneity in the clinical data that are, have been collected. So now we have agreed on one common template, all the university medical centers map to the same template. And as such, we can start to provide a portal to indicate how many patients are available in which we have the information as is uh, available within the uh, uh, ISERIC uh, 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 WHO ECRF. And step by step, we are uh, uh, trying to uh, include uh, uh, more data into the, to the portal. So the first version of the portal will make it uh, possible to search and know for how many people data in the ECRF are available in the hospitals that we connect. But increasingly, we will also make other data like imaging data uh, available. And uh, with, for example, with the uh, uh, Dutch uh, uh, Society of Radiology, a national image biobank is being formed. And this is through the same principle. There's one portal and the individual centers ensure that they collect their data adhering to the standards. They notify which data are available and either data are uh, uh, in this case sent to, to a central station or uh, software can be sent to the data centers in order to, to, to access the data. So it's really important, I think, and this is what the other researchers said, this is more the uh, perspective of the clinical data 
than the imaging data and we have to uh, uh, link them and, 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 and harmonize them. But eventually, of course, the richness of information uh, uh, becomes, becomes larger if we can link it to other data initiatives. So we, we, we have to work together to see how we can link these initiatives to the European initiatives and how we can link the, the preclinical or the virology data to the clinical patient data. So summarizing, I think um, uh, uh, we sh there, there's the, 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 I agree with my own co-pons. Uh, data sharing is easier said than done. I think the vision is there, but it's a, it's a hard battle to really get there. There's a number of challenges to overcome. Uh, what is the legal base? How do we easily arrange the consent for the reuse of data? Um, the moment you connect more and more data, data governance becomes an issue and you have to ensure that every stakeholder is on board and it agrees with the governance and it should not prohibit or make the reuse of data very cumbersome. Um, to actually locally organize your data that they adhere to the international standards is a lot of work. You need a good a team, uh, you need data stewards. Once you have that, uh, we need these the, the, a portal uh, which gives access to this federated infrastructure. And I, I think especially on the European level and also earlier today, we saw some great examples of such portals. And then, uh, yeah, once this is there, we, we're not there. We, we are starting from the clinical data mainly collected in the hospitals, but we wanna link to so many other data. And then the process of how to link uh, uh, still uh, ensuring uh, data privacy, et cetera, is an issue. But I think we really have to take these steps because the, uh, the opportunities are enormous. We can perform analyses at larger scales. We can start to think about distributed learning using AI methods, et cetera. And I think actually these efforts are not only gonna be relevant for COVID, but they, they will actually help us in, in many aspects in medicine where we would like to learn from data to treat the next generations of patients better. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vero. Very uh, uh, impressive talk also, because you, besides the clarity of the challenges that uh, are being faced, you also present this overall national architecture uh, that it is, makes things quite clear. You have, um, the time is uh, over, uh, but we still have lots of questions. So uh, I, will, I will eat a little bit, five minutes into the break, just to allow one or two questions uh, per speaker. A number of the questions in Slido refer to GDPR and privacy issues. Uh, they are to Guy uh, and to Marion, uh, but although uh, Vero uh, replied to them to some extent, but uh, I would like to give the opportunity to Guy to comment. So the question is, uh, how uh, are you tackling in the COVID-19 platform GDPR and privacy issues for the clinical data and to whether you have any guidelines or recommendations um, for other countries to use. Uh, the, um, uh, for Marion, there was a related question, the uh, how do you anonymize personal data? But then I'll give it for the same questions to Vir also the opportunity since he talked at the end about it. So each, each one of you a comment about these issues of uh, personal um, private data and GDPR. D? Guy, sorry. Thank you. So yeah, so um, on the GDPR issues, so the platform, the European COVID-19 data platform is a system that brings together many different databases running, as we heard in different uh, under different systems in different places. Uh, so each of those databases, so if there's an opportunity to, to push data in some way into one of those databases, then that is accompanied by a, a GDPR uh, framework for each of those. For the, um, it's not complicated for, for the viral, or not so complicated for the viral data. Uh, so uh, they typically have a, a, a similar process. For the human uh, biomolecular, and this question I think was about the clinical data in particular, uh, and any clinical data that flow centrally into the EGA, which is the system for sensitive data, um, then there is a, a framework that exists, has been in place for, for, for many years, and it is a system where one assigns, uh, so there's a technical component to that that provides the security and the, the uh, secure way of operating on data and accessing data when one has access. 
Um, and then there is a, a set of processes that uh, assign a data access committee. Uh, so the ethical consent giving process surrounding, surrounding the setup of a study uh, leads to the creation must, in, in the case of EJ, it, 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 we require a data access committee. That access committee oversees decisions about which groups, uh, uh, upon access requests, which groups are allowed to, which groups are not allowed to access data, and then technically the central system uh, makes that available. So there's a whole framework around the process of that, but fundamentally uh, an access committee is, is um, established for each study that goes into the system. Uh, that's offered as a, as a set of technical components when we build out into different countries, the local, the national nodes of the, of the federated EGA. Um, however, it's not necessarily what will be taken. Uh, so it's possible there will be different GDPR frameworks operating in different national, national nodes. And so, so I, don't, I don't think it's right to look at it as a single system, it's a set of different systems, uh, and each addresses GDPR in, in perhaps different ways. Okay, thank you. Marian, how do you, um, uh, do, you uh, do you anonymize personal data uh, of patients and uh, what system is used to do that is the question. Um, well, so, so what we, yes, we do, uh, uh, essentially we do not share potentially sensitive data. So it is data for which uh, there is permission for uh, so it, it, it's not that that can be released so that's also been our uh, thinking with the data hub so what what moves in there is data that would potentially be allowed to go to to be public uh, but where we're trying to see how can you then link back to private data sets that are uh, for instance, part of the, the clinical initiative that uh, Vero is uh, mentioning. That has been the approach so far. But what we also are now uh, trying to map with the Vero project is if you look at a more complex data structure that I tried to explain, um, are you going to run into new uh, uh, issues from the com combination of data? So, uh, because the, the different fields have very different cultures of sharing. So we can share very easily if we work on human data for the virus genomes, for instance, if we do the same in an animal disease outbreak situation, the permission stream is very different. So, so that's what we're trying to map. If you, if you take this landscape of uh, SARS-CoV related studies that are ongoing, where do you run into uh, conflicting permissions? And then how do we deal with that? So that's the okay. part of the, 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 the project. Okay, we're on the same question. Yes. Uh, this general register of consent that you referred to in the beginning, is this part of the solution? Yeah, so it, it, it remains to be seen whether the, the, the politicians or the, the it will be eventually effectuated. So we're discussing uh, th this aspect at the moment. We're indeed uh, pseudonymizing the data. At the moment, we collect them for reuse, uh, um, and we have to ensure with the pseudonymization we don't lose the link to the original data. So that's uh, that's important. I do think that the, the federated infrastructure does give us an opportunity to address this, this, this problem. Because if you, if you keep your data locally on the local control, but you just make known which data there is, and there's a clear mechanism for what question you can uh, uh, send software to, to the data to, to collect those data. The, the, in principle, you can think of solutions to deal with the issue that data are private and are only going to be used for certain specific questions and then it's made explicit and then you can look at the specific consent in that situation. So I think we have to, so I think the, the, the federated infrastructure yeah. gives us uh, opportunities to handle with the issue of, of consent, but a, a national consent register, I think it would be very, very great. I, I mean, I as a citizen myself, I would like to sort of also be, know what data are being used and easily say yes or no to different uses or questions. Uh, uh, so I think a national uh, register for COVID would go into that direction. 
Okay, thank you. Um, another question uh, for Marion uh, is an interesting one. Uh, it is, uh, the question is, are there any measures to minimize the risk that medical data providers lose markets opportunities, market opportunities uh, due to sharing of their data openly? So this is one of those tricky culture questions. Um, so how would you reconcile reconcile uh, well, the, um, the yeah, market market opportunities with the open data sharing? Yeah. So I think that needs to be reinvented. So it's a discussion we had at the institutional level because of the so for instance the the infrastructure that that the, the health research infrastructures that that uh, Vero has been uh, involved in uh, come from the health arena where there is uh, certain cultures of public private partnerships, for instance, uh, and the firewalls around that in the emerging disease arena, the, the past five years or so, the, the push is open share immediately. I mean, we get calls from WHO if they know something is happening and two days later we haven't shared the information. So it's a very different culture, which also uh, uh, industry has to abide by. So for instance, the data genome sequences, um, it used to be um, information that if you have that, you have a, an advance in, in for instance, being able to develop a vaccine or something like that, you cannot do that anymore. So we have to reinvent how those rules of engagement are. And I think that's one of the very complicated issues. So if, if, if I abide by uh, the, the classical or the, the, the rules that we have, have in place for all sorts of other research, I would be breaching all agreements in the emerging disease arena. So, and that's a common ground that we need to find and develop. It's really a, a okay. new rule of conduct with, uh, yeah, with with the the speed of emerging disease outbreaks. If I, if I can add to that, um, please. So, so remember, of course, I think what we're we're moving towards is a share and share alike culture where um, people put in, but they get back. And, 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 and so there are opportunities around getting back. We know a lot more about disease systems uh, by having platforms such as these. And um, the opportunities are for everyone in the research world. And that includes people who wish to have to develop market opportunities as well. So knowing about the targets, knowing about the compounds that are available as targets gives huge opportunities as well. So, so I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's a switch, it's a change um, but it, it's openness, it's openness for lots of different applications, and I think it's worth bearing that in mind. But, but it does, that goes back to the what is in it for me question. So this is one of the key uh, barriers. We've done research in the COMPARE project. Um, is of course, a potential IP loss. Um, so what can others do if you share your data? And that's uh, as often mentioned in public health partners as it is in academia, as it is in industry. So, um, and so those are things to, you know, figure out uh, what is the code of conduct for this open system. Okay, so this, uh, let me ask one last question because we're really out of time and we have many questions, hopefully, they can be discussed, some of them at least, in the next session. Uh, it is a, a question to, to Vero uh, on um, uh, how can machine learning uh, help to understand the evolution of the pandemic? Do you, do you intend to do it? Do you intend to use it? Yeah, I think, I think uh, machine learning is very widely used. Eh? So I think if you make data available, you can address many questions and you can do it with a traditional biostatistics and you can do it with machine learning. And machine learning uh, has two strengths. One is, uh, I think it can be very well used in uh, exploratory research. If there is very, uh, uh, um, yeah, re re if you have large complex data and you follow people over time, 
uh, uh, machine learning can learn uh, unpredicted patterns between these data. So, so just trying to understand the relationship between input and output, if it's, it's not a simple function, if, it's, uh, if it cannot be done with, with multivariate regression, maybe a machine learning uh, algorithm can link the input data to the output data and it can provide insights to, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 prognostics, trying to develop novel prognostic procedures. And that's the second strength, I think, of machine learning approaches. Once you have established uh, possible connections, you can start to learn for an individual what uh, uh, what his or her risk profile is, et cetera. So I think the, the, the diagnostic accuracy and the sensitivity and specificity of diagnostic and pro prognostic procedures may uh, increase because of using machine learning approaches. But, but these developments crucially uh, rely on having access to good data for development and validation. Um, okay, very clear. Thank you very much, all the panelists. Uh, many more questions. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody can stay to the next uh, panel discussion uh, where you can, uh, you can still ask them. Uh, I ate up your uh, by half almost your your coffee break. So now 16 minutes coffee break before we start again. Thank you all.